in the project developed. Um, well, first of all, I, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, committee of gallery at Cal IT2 um, who have uh, been uh, extremely dynamic in uh, putting these uh, projects together. And uh, without that uh, committee, uh, it would be impossible to um, get all, all of this done. Um, and of course, uh, one of the important things ab about the gallery is that we have been trying to meet and amplify um, the transdisciplinary condition of Cal IT2. And certainly uh, Ramesh Rao and Sheldon Brown and Larry Schmar uh, were at the core of trying to develop a, a matrix of the transdisciplinary uh, that allowed uh, the arts and uh, sciences and engineering to have uh, a beginning uh, dialogue. And uh, certainly the projects that we have done are uh, an initiation, if you will, uh, for um, some of the structure of this dialogue. Uh, gallery at Cal IT2 reflects the nexus of innovation implicit at Cal IT2's vision and aims to advance our understanding and appreciation of the dynamic interplay among art, science, and technology. The space is located off the main lobby right over here, uh, for those of you who haven't uh, been there before. Uh, and um, uh, we hope that uh, Cal IT2, uh, in partnership here with UCSD and UC Irvine, uh, will allow uh, researchers from different disciplines uh, to participate in the qualities of research that art uh, can bring to the foreground. Uh, the project today, uh, as you can see, is the Anti-Personal Minds Project by uh, Carlos Tril uh, Trilnik, uh, a dynamic and international artist from Argentina. Uh, and it's been a, a pleasure uh, to work with him and uh, to have our um, crew, uh, like uh, Trish Stone and Hector and others, uh, really uh, create a, a space for the installation. And of course, one of the breakouts of the installation out here in the courtyard, where you can see the uh, landmine uh, tags, uh, we hope that people uh, take a caution as they walk around the teddy bear. Uh, and all of this is to... Um, in a certain sense, bring to the, the foreground uh, uh, another element of, of this particular uh, project for Cal IT2 and gallery at Cal IT2 is that we've attempted to do this uh, in uh, a bilingual, both English and Spanish, so that the catalog uh, will carry both voices, both traditions, uh, so that the Northern Cone and Southern Cone can also enact uh, a space in this transdisciplinary space. And I certainly want to thank uh, Doug Ramsey and his crew uh, for uh, really allowing us to, to push this uh, forward and expanding uh, the tradition of the catalog in terms of this particular project. Um, the other element that is important uh, before we uh, go into the, the core of this is that uh, UC Darnett, uh, another element of research in uh, the transdisciplinary space of art and science, uh, will be having uh, a violence, technology, and public intervention panel uh, next week, uh, April 24th from uh, noon to 5 p.m. Uh, here at Cal IT2. And again, we will uh, use uh, uh, Carlos Trilnik's Anti-Personal Minds Project as a way to look at uh, the histories, theories, and media around public intervention uh, as it's currently playing itself out, uh, both in practice of artists and uh, theorists. So I invite you to uh, please come and participate in that. Uh, since uh, 1980, Carlos Trinic has been one of the pioneers of video art in Latin America. His work has ranged from video installation to multimedia art uh, to photography to online projects. Um, it is a, a pleasure uh, to have him here, uh, to have him cross uh, the arcs of realities all the way from uh, Buenos Aires and uh, to allow us to uh, consider uh, the question of um, violence, 
uh, and the after effects in terms of technologies such as the uh, landmine, uh, which of course um, continues a life even after uh, the sites of war, uh, creating bodies that are maimed uh, and, and bodies uh, that are unable to crisscross the land uh, and uh, um, something that uh, continues to uh, be a hardship on, on a global level. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, ask uh, in a critical and aesthetic way, uh, how is our locality here in San Diego uh, and in the area a part of this economy uh, and what can be done? Um, so um, the speakers today, uh, in order, uh, will be uh, Fabian Cerrejido, uh, a PhD and an artist in his own right, uh, born in Argentina, growing up in Mexico, uh, who will uh, contextualize uh, Latin American and Ar Argentinian art and the wider uh, post-contemporary contemporary scene uh, that Carlos' work uh, might be viewed through. Uh, Carlos will then present uh, a, a view of his own work in relation to what we're seeing right now. Uh, it will be in Spanish, as part of this uh, larger context of the transdisciplinary for us, uh, and uh, we're passing out uh, the lecture there for you to read. And then uh, Dr. Uh, or Bill Trogler, uh, that was kind enough to join us, who is a professor uh, here at UCSD in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, as well as uh, affiliated faculty member of the Nano Engineering uh, Program at Jacob Schools of Engineering. And uh, he will be uh, presenting part of uh, the work uh, that he has been uh, participating, that is uh, creating inexpensive uh, portable electronic devices uh, for specific detection of toxic chemicals. Uh, and then hopefully having a brief conversation uh, between the issues of art, uh, technology and uh, this question of uh, landmines around the world and then open it up to uh, a Q&A. Again, uh, thank you so much for attending and uh, uh, please uh, uh, take a look at the installation. Uh, or if you have a chance, uh, spread it with other uh, community and of course enjoy uh, the reception. Uh, thank you very much and uh, Fabian, if you'll come up here. Gracias. Hello. Hi, everybody. Well, uh, I would like to. Oh, <laughs> this is this is not my text. Um, I would like to s start by thanking uh, for the invitation uh, to this uh, to this event. It's been um, I know Carla for some time, uh, and it's great to finally come together. It's something that has to do with what we do when we don't just hang out. And thank you, and Ricardo, for including me in this, and everybody who made possible the organization of this event. Um, well, I've been given the um, job of give some history to the um, uh, ongoings of the avant-garde in Latin America. And, uh, oh, I already have, I was expecting to have the image there, but I, but I don't. Um, Oh, thanks. And the little thing? All right. Okay. So what I would like to do is to give a, a very uh, summary, fast uh, notion of a certain slant of the avant-garde uh, in Latin America um, that uh, might help us see how we come to Carlos without being too... Um, uh, deterministic. I think that some of that made it all the way to Carlos. Um, to start, I think we can identify some elements that are not exclusive to the Latin American avant-garde, but that were particularly relevant and resonant in the area. First one is the embrace of the immediate and distant past, unlike the uh, avant-garde of other places, or unlike the avant-garde in, in general. There was a, a very um, uh, a very clear effort to um, embrace the past. That's the case of people like uh, Oswald de Andrade in Brazil, um, Siqueiros in Mexico, 
remember those murals with pre-Columbian elements. And I wanted to bring something that was less um, familiar, maybe, the work of Shul Solar um, that incorporates elements of uh, pre-Columbian art, African, Egyptian, and so on. Then a second element that I think is distinctive about the um, uh, avant-garde in Latin America is a radical syncretism. As I said, Shul Solar incorporated elements of cultures from many, many different places. Uh, and Torre Garcia was from Uruguay. Um, also, he had this uh, type of cubism. He was part of the, of the cubist. But as you can see, he incorporates cultural imagery from, uh, from different places and certainly from uh, Latin America. Um, the third element is the uh, exploration of uh, new materials. That is quite well known about Cicados himself, who e experimented with uh, new synthetic resins and uh, elements like that, but also with the uh, compositional techniques of uh, cinema. And uh, one artist that early in the go in Argentina um, investigated these uh, new elements was uh, Cosice, who did um, works with water and cinetic uh, work, so that this um, element of the, the fact the avant-garde was uh, going into the uh, new materials was uh, one with the uh, gesture towards the uh, social sphere, the public sphere, and that's our fourth element that, of course, I'm not saying that uh, this is exclusive of the Latin American uh, avant-garde, but it was quite, quite um, marked. And so this radical engagement of the public sphere and political uh, reality was there from the get-go from the um, historical avant-garde of the 20s and 30s, but also a, had a very peculiar twist in the 50s and 60s when the uh, political situation in uh, Latin America, and particularly in the South Cone, and particularly in Argentina, was incredibly volatile. Um, particularly in reference to conceptual art, we can see some distinctions there. Let's say that the conceptual art, um, in general, interrogated the status and preciousness of the autonomous work of art, taking its cue from the pioneer work of uh, Marcel Duchamp. But the development of conceptual art in Latin America was intimately related to the direct address of political questions in the, in the place. If one of the historical reference, particularly in America, was uh, Joseph Kosuth, it'd be nice to draw some distinctions there. If you remember, he famously said that the absence of reality in art was the reality of art. Conceptual art of those years added preoccupations regarding the limits the recurrences and the tautologies of language, and it gave particular relevance to linguistic fluxes affecting the institutions, reception, and consumption of art. The local practitioners were particularly interested in gearing this activity towards not only analyzing these fluxes, but also in changing the institution and social structures that supported them. And in this, I want to make reference to two folks. This fellow, eh, Oscar Masota, eh, he was uh, a conceptual artist that is famous for many works, but one of them was the helicopter, which consisted, well, it's a long thing to explain, but believe me, this was one of his works. He um, is the theorician also, he's curious what the span of his work, he is the um, 
the theorician who introduced the work of Jacques Lacan to the Spanish-speaking world. And it is curious to notice that being this um, engaged in um, psychoanalysis, and particularly the part of psychoanalysis that incorporated um, Sasurian linguistics, he was a very committed uh, revolutionary. Then when asked, hey, why do you do all these things that are so complicated for the people to understand? He said, well, but there will be a moment when they will understand. And he was very gambled towards that. And he ended up, like Carlos and like yours truly, in exile. The second person that I would like to uh, bring into the discussion, because I think that there we can make a, an apple-to-apple -apple, uh, comparison, is Graciela Carnevale. This is a work by uh, Graciela Carnevale, uh, who is one of the artists who participated in, a, uh, in an emblematic uh, action, which was called, uh, whoops, hey, I'm sorry, here. It was called Tucumán Arde. It was celebrated because, ah, there. It was uh, celebrated because many conceptual artists participated in it, but it was basically, it was a, um, an exhibition to tell the world about what was going on in the northern province of Tucumán that was greatly being affected by the uh, uh, economic policies of the military government of the time. The exhibit took place in two unions, and some other time we should talk more about it. But I wanted to come to Graciela Carnevale because at the time of the inception of conceptual and minimal art in Argentina, something very peculiar happened with her. Um, in 1966, Graciela was living in Buenos Aires, even though she's from Rosario, like Carlos, and she was invent uh, invited to an exhibit called Estructuras Primarias II, Primary Structures Two, And this was, in a way, was a, uh, a coy ploy by one local uh, critic who had, uh, had been at the first uh, basic structure exhibit in New York um, and wanted to make basic structure two to incorporate the local conceptual artists to the uh, international circuit. And so, um, he did this, and the young artists were introduced to the notions of uh, minimalist space. This show took place in 1966 in the Jewish Museum in New York. Um, and when she was asked to um, participate, she did a work that she herself was kind of uh, not that enthusiastic about. It was uh, two kilograms of uh, different materials, one of lead and one of feathers, and well, the, there was a big uh, contrast between one and the other. Um, it was curious to see her being so dismissive about her past work. But then, um, when uh, informed about the type of space that the curator wanted, that was, that was a, a space in which um, the spectator was included, that made more of, a, of an impression in her. So she wasn't that keen on minimalism's uh, lack of uh, personal impronta or lack of anecdote or um, the fact that, the, um, that there wasn't a, a gesture. But uh, she did like what uh, Michael Fried calls the viewer-inclusive minimalist space. So that same year, when this exhibition took place, she did her own version of uh, minimalism. It took place in Mar del Plata, and it was called Arte por el Aire, the exhibit. Her piece consisted of piling up daily editions of the three main periodicals of the city that were issued during the 40 days of the exhibit. The viewer-inclusive minimalist space became smaller and smaller as the news piled in the space of the gallery. 
Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I will read my presentation in Spanish and you have the, the English version. So, eh, good afternoon. En primer lugar, quiero agradecer a Eduardo Navas, con quien el año pasado, en largas charlas de café, pensé la idea de presentar el proyecto de minas antipersonales en Cali 2. También a Ricardo Domínguez y al Comité de Cali 2 por su buena predisposición hacia el proyecto y por permitirme estar aquí hoy. Al profesor y artista Brian Goldfart, aquí presente, por su interés en generar nexos y colaboraciones entre investigadores, artistas y universidades de norte a sur y de sur a norte de América. A UC Darnet por la organización del simposio eh, Arte, eh, Tecnología y eh, Espacios Públicos, que le dará un marco especial a la muestra, abriendo un espacio de análisis y debate sobre las relaciones entre desarrollo tecnológico y sociedad. La muestra ha motivado estas actividades paralelas que completan gran parte de su objetivo de su objetivo. El mundo de hoy necesita pensar seriamente y con responsabilidad cuál va a ser su futuro inmediato y cómo desandar el camino que nos ha depositado en la desigualdad social extrema y en el desastre ecológico alarmante que vive nuestra sociedad. La huella que está dejando el ser humano sobre la superficie de la Tierra es muchas veces aberrante. Nos empeñamos en dañar al prójimo y por lo tanto dañar al mundo o a la inversa. No importa el orden, el resultado es un deterioro permanente de las condiciones humanas, de millones de personas y de la salud de la Tierra. La problemática de las minas antipersonales es solo una parte de este panorama global. No es la única arma de guerra ni el conflicto que más víctimas causa. Su peor característica es quedar latente, transcurrir en el tiempo. Es por eso que las principales víctimas son civiles, muchas veces no alertados de minas sembradas años atrás. Más de medio millón de personas han sido atacadas por las minas antipersonales, con el resultado de miles de niños y adultos muertos y mutilados. Según la mayoría de las estadísticas, hay plantadas en la Tierra 110 millones de minas listas para explotar. La muestra que presento en Cali 2 gira en torno a este tema, pero no de manera excluyente. Es un ejemplo que puede expandirse a otros sistemas igualmente siniestros creados por el hombre para dominar, atemorizar, herir y matar a otros seres humanos, a otros hombres. Es un señalamiento sobre un tema que debe ser resuelto para que millones de personas puedan habitar sus tierras sin el riesgo de ser muertos o mutilados. Zonas del mundo que a la vez son las más castigadas por la pobreza y la desigualdad social y de oportunidades. Países que no puedan hacer frente a la ardua tarea de desminado y a la costosa ayuda médica y social que cada víctima requiere. Es por este motivo por el cual pienso que el simposio, que acompaña y complementa la muestra, puede ser un punto de partida para encontrar desde el saber académico una solución simple, práctica y barata para la tarea de desminado. Sabemos de la capacidad de invención de los laboratorios de investigación tecnológico universitario. De allí han surgido inventos que ayudan a mejorar la calidad de vida. Lamentablemente también, muchas veces esos recursos y conocimientos se vuelcan hacia el desarrollo de tecnologías de guerra, destrucción y muerte. El proyecto Minas Antipersonales es un intento por generar conciencia sobre estos temas y por poner sobre la mesa de discusión cuáles pueden ser los aportes que desde la ciencia y el arte podemos hacer para buscar que todos los países del mundo y las organizaciones políticas no estatales se comprometan a la destrucción de sus reservas de minas, abandonar de una vez por todas su utilización y fabricación y a volcar los recursos que se utilizan en su fabricación a la investigación para desarrollar sistemas de desminado. La vida no puede estar por debajo de los intereses ideológicos, políticos, estratégicos y económicos. La creatividad en el desarrollo tecnológico debe estar en función de mejorar y no empeorar la calidad de vida de los habitantes del mundo. Si algo diferencia el arte de otras actividades, es que pueda abordar todos los temas que hacen a la vida social. 
puede generar ilusiones y sueños, despertar sensibilidades y ayudar a generar conciencia sobre aspectos de la realidad que deben ser revisados. No creo que el arte tenga una sola función, ni una sola razón de ser. Sería una contradicción hacia su propia naturaleza y a la libertad de expresión. El arte es territorio de experimentación y, como tal, conviven en sus prácticas múltiples propuestas y estilos de trabajo. Pienso que en este gran universo de diversidades hay lugar pa para que desde el arte se generen señalamientos, denuncias y propuestas sobre temas que afectan al ser humano y al mundo. No es el único rol del arte en la sociedad, pero estoy seguro de que es una de sus potencialidades más extraordinarias. En mi trabajo artístico y docente, la realidad juega un rol importante. Quizás por mi pertenencia a una zona del mundo que desde hace cientos de años vive políticas de exclusión, marginación, avasallamiento de las identidades originarias y destrucción del medio ambiente. En el contexto latinoamericano, me es imposible no ser sensible a estos temas y que estos sean parte de mis propuestas. De la misma forma, intento buscar formas y métodos de inclusión social. Hemos diseñado, desde mi cátedra en la Universidad de Buenos Aires, sistemas de talleres, cursos y actividades lúdicas para niños y jóvenes de sectores de la población de bajos recursos económicos. Las tecnologías digitales simplifican esta tarea. A la vez reduce la diferenciación social que se establece entre las clases sociales y al acceso a los nuevos medios y se ofrecen nuevas posibilidades de expresión. El proyecto Piquete de Ojo es un sistema de autoexpresión para sectores de la población desocupados. Es una obra pensada con el objetivo de proveer tecnología digital para generar información desde el punto de vista del damnificado por las políticas económicas ultra, ultraliberales. En Llanto de Bandoneón, la idea gira en torno a las manifestaciones realizadas por artistas e intelectuales en contra de la privatización de Radio Municipal, único medio de comunicación público de la Ciudad de Buenos Aires. Aquí trabajé con el símbolo del tango, que transmite, mediante un pequeño monitor insertado en el instrumento musical y a través de ondas de baja frecuencia de video, el registro de estas acciones. También lo es Proyecto de Ushuaia, instalación diseñada para la Bienal del Fin del Mundo, realizada en 2008 en la ciudad más austral del mundo, donde he trabajado con un grupo de jóvenes de la ciudad que han registrado en video su cotidianidad y sus puntos de vista de una ciudad que en apariencia es el paraíso del turismo, pero que esconde una realidad signada por la falta de oportunidades y de actividades para su población juvenil, situación que genera alcoholismo, drogadicción, embarazos adolescentes y suicidios. El proyecto Memoria, realizado eh, con jóvenes de la Villa La Cava, la mayor de la provincia de Buenos Aires, con más de 30.000 habitantes, que vive en una situación de pobreza extrema jamás imaginada. Fue un proyecto que nació como taller de video y medios digitales, que se unió a una invitación para hacer una obra sobre los 30 años de la dictadura militar en Argentina. Los jóvenes revisaron el tema de las dictaduras que caracterizaron a América del Sur durante los años 70 y 80 y sus influencias sobre las políticas económicas actuales. El resultado fue un video que retrata esta situación y a la vez dio continuidad al trabajo de talleres que se mantiene hasta hoy con la colaboración de mi equipo universitario. En estos proyectos, los participantes tuvieron la posibilidad de exponer sus trabajos junto a artistas reconocidos y participar de actividades culturales que generalmente están dirigidas a una minoría. Surge entonces eh, una cuestión, cuestiones que son más profundas, que es que si el arte debe continuar siendo una actividad de élite, ¿quién puede ser considerado artista? y por qué el arte suele ser un espacio reducido a grupos de iluminados. El arte es, según mi parecer, un factor fundamental de cambio social y un instrumento de transformación política. Es la forma de reacción frente a situaciones que extremecen. En las instalaciones, ¿por qué pintar un cuadro negro? Y en 1978-2003, la propuesta fue intervenir el espacio con telas negras, 
En la primera acción, la primera acción la realicé en una zona del campo argentino que se caracteriza por su fertilidad. Solo el 3% de la superficie terrestre tiene las condiciones ideales para el cultivo de alimentos y esta zona es parte de ese porcentaje. La obra realizada en 2002 fue para advertir que a pocos kilómetros de ese lugar hay niños muriendo de desnutrición y más de un 20% de la población que no tiene alimentos para sobrevivir. Muchas eh, tierras muchas veces ocupadas por inver, in, inversionistas que especulan con los precios internacionales de los alimentos y que no hace más de 100 años pertenecían a comunidades indígenas, hoy marginadas social y culturalmente. En 1978-2003, la tela negra tapa el arco donde Argentina se consagró por primera vez campeona de fútbol. La idea fue generar un contrahomenaje al Mundial de Fútbol organizado por la dictadura militar en Argentina en 1978, con el fin de limpiar su imagen internacional. Fue también la primera vez que se transmitió televisión en color y a todo el mundo, desde Argentina. Este video fue producido por el canal de TV de la Ciudad de Buenos Aires y emitido por una señal, por esa señal llegando a miles de televidentes y dando la oportunidad de debatir las relaciones entre política, medios masivos de comunicación y deporte. Esta obra y otra sobre la dictadura y sus consecuencias, como inmóvil, una tarde y como un cuerpo ausente, ponen en cuestión el tema de la violencia política y sus consecuencias, son a la vez parte de mi historia personal. En los tres videos de la serie Museos, realizada entre 1990 y 1999, celada, vísperas, geometrías de turbulencia, el eje narrativo pasa por revisar de qué forma las sociedades establecen discursos de poder a través de la museología. Son a la vez relecturas de la historia oficial latinoamericana. El tema de museos lo estoy trabajando eh, actualmente desde la fotografía, El tema de museos lo estoy trabajando actualmente desde la fotografía, generando fotomontajes como tres incas tomadas en el Museo de Cuenca, Ecuador, y piedras tomadas en el Museo Nacional de Bogotá. La cultura sudamericana, en el sentido de entender el subcontinente como un lugar de mestizaje y confluencias culturales, está también presente en obras como Cusco, Eh, viajando, viajando por América, Ecopark y Teot. La influencia del diseño indígena está también presente en otras obras como Adsbites, eh, Social Less y en la serie HHHHH y en otras obras donde la búsqueda es quizás más cercana a la de la pintura en movimiento y en las que puedo otorgarme el tiempo para editar animaciones cuadro a cuadro. Forma, Fórmula Formulario es una, una obra inédita que presentaré en Buenos Aires durante este año. Se trata de un proyecto de videoinstalación sobre bancos de datos y sobre la información que complementamos cuando llenamos formularios. La idea es poner en cuestión... ¿Qué dicen de nosotros estos formularios? ¿Cuánto de verdad contienen? ¿Y quién termina administrando nuestros datos? Referido a la obra que presento hoy en la Galería Calitú, es un proyecto que nació hace dos años cuando fui convocado por la escritora Cristina Sivale para participar de un grupo de artistas e intelectuales con el objetivo de buscar formas creativas para la difusión de problemáticas relacionadas al tema de refugiados. Este grupo se reúne en Lancur, alto comisionado de las Naciones Unidas por los Refugiados. Desde hace un tiempo estaba trabajando en el tema de minas antipersonales. Viajo muy seguido a Colombia, Perú y Ecuador, y en estos países es un tema central que afecta principalmente a las comunidades indígenas y campesinas. También Centroamérica, los límites sur de Argentina y Chile, y los de Chile con Perú y Bolivia, están altamente contaminados con minas antipersonales. Encontré una asociación directa entre las características temporales del sistema de minas antipersonales, 
las del video y las de los sistemas interactivos. Investigando más sobre el tema, veo que, po que unos pocos países no han firmado los tratados de Ottawa, entre ellos los Estados Unidos. Me parece increíble que siendo un negocio tan pequeño en relación a lo que cuesta, por ejemplo, un misil o un fusil automático, se sigan fabricando este tipo de armas cuando está totalmente demostrado que sus efectos son principalmente sobre la población civil y básicamente sobre niños y mujeres que no participan de los conflictos bélicos. El proyecto finalmente se presenta hoy aquí, en un lugar que creo es muy simbólico. Este campus fue un campo militar, lo que demuestra que si hay voluntad podemos cambiar armas y entrenamiento militar por libros e investigación para la paz. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Well, I didn't quite know what to, to do here today, so I'll give an introduction on some of uh, the techniques used to remove mines people might be interested in. And this will be the closest thing to art in the talk. This is the uh, <laughs> a fluor fluoroscopic reagent we've developed to detect traces of explosives, TNT in this case. Uh, someone touched a piece of paper after handling TNT. And you can visualize it down to sub-nanogram levels. So uh, in explosive screening and in landmine, there are a number of problems that you'd have to address technically if you're going to look at removing them. The first is a sampling system. Do you want to detect the vapor? There's a small amount of vapor that comes out of landmines from dinitrotoluene and TNT, uh, since that's generally the cheap explosive that's used in them. And so that's one approach. Another approach is try and vacuum and sample particulates and then vaporize those to detect them because explosives often have very low vapor pressures, which makes them difficult to detect. And of course, there are issues of preconcentration. Uh, we don't really do any of this. <laughs> We're more interested in the chemical sensing part. Uh, so there's usually a detector involved in uh, any sort of uh, attempt to detect explosives, and it usually uses a physical property, uh, spectroscopy. In our case, we use a chemically sensitive reagent whose fluorescence is quenched in the presence of explosives. Then, of course, there's always a readout issue, signal processing. Uh, that would be something Cal-IT would love. And, uh, and then, of course, that has to be coupled with the decision making, and this can either involve a computer or a person. And then, of course, there's an error rate to the whole process. And one of the very difficult things in explosive detection is that you really can't afford to make too many errors, at least uh, <laughs> calling things safe that aren't safe. And so generally, you settle for a bunch of false alarms, which can lead to a, a big problem. So for example, in detecting landmines, the earliest landmines contain metal parts, fuses, and casing. And so a metal detector really is the most successful means of locating them. But of course, that's relatively nonspecific. It detects any metal. And for example, in Cambodia, a study by the RAND Corporation said that of about 200 million items excavated during humanitarian demining and between 1992 and 1988, only about half a million of the 200 million, which is about 0.3%, so that's your success, uh, your false alarm rate is about 99.7%. Uh, only about 0.3% of the hits were mines and other explosive devices. And then, of course, removing them is very tedious. It's very dangerous. And it's always amazed me why mines don't have a lifetime built into them so that after two years or three years or whatever, they just deactivate. Because it seems to me that would be the simplest solution to uh, avoiding the fact that when these minefields uh, have no longer have any use, either uh, someone has to go in from the army and very high risk of getting blown up, or else uh, civilians are wandering into these fields and get blown up. And I'm sure that technology could be developed. So it seems to me that if you don't ban mines, the least you could do is try to make them have a shelf life that, <laughs> at which they go ineffective. 
Uh, there's nearly useful technology. One of the ones that's been around a long time is ground penetrating radar. Uh, the problem here is you look at reflected radio waves up to the microwave region and you detect anomalies in soil and of course you find rocks, roots, wood, all sorts of things when you do that. So again, it's a very tedious process and uh, that's still under development. Signal processing issues, rain and soil type can affect the depth and uh, there's a fair amount of research still going on in that area. Most of the other means are that are being used are pretty much experimental ones. Those are many of the methods that are in the front. Uh, again, processing alarm resolution either involves an operator or in more modern systems, such as in the airport, baggage screening, a computer actually makes the decision. And so there's a lot of interest in automated image analysis, and of course, a place like Cal IT is a big area for that. Uh, and so the methods I've just mentioned really are bulk detection. You're detecting the mass of explosives in the bomb or charge itself. Uh, another set of methods use high energy radiation. And this is what's usually used at airports, x-ray screening. And uh, the problem with all of these methods uh, for explosive detection is that the sensor is almost always within the kill radius of the charge. They have small standoff distances. and so it's inherently very hazardous work. And so, for example, in x-ray methods for package and personnel screening, some that might be adapted for landmines or backscattering, uh, x-ray backscatter enhances viewing of organics, uh, and it might be a way to locate mines in soil, but there really uh, hasn't been much done. In the area of airports, this is the difference between looking at a briefcase and transmission and looking at by backscattered x-rays where uh, the lighter weight plastic gun and explosives uh, and liquid explosives will show up in the reflected image. And so those are some of the means you could think of adapting for mines, but of course this would be relatively expensive. Uh, there are nuclear methods. These are good for penetrating. Uh, they're similar to x-ray and they're often used in large cargo and uh, I don't really know of anybody using that for landmines. NQR did have some interest in landmine detection. It's a spectroscopic way of de detecting nitrogen and explosives in soil. The trouble is it has low sensitivity. And then finally, the area we're interested in is trace detections where you look for small amounts of vapors or particles. And the high sensitivity, though, inherently leads them susceptible to false positives. And so this is our competition. It's my other artistic slide. It's a mobile biosensor. It's waterproof, as you can see. It can trace odors to source, rapidly covers a net large area, can identify a scent in a mixture of odors, which is something uh, scientists have trouble doing. But it's somewhat expensive to train, maintain, and operate. It tires easily, and you can distract it with a hamburger quite readily. And so this is the issue with explosives and going after vapor. Uh, TNT is barely volatile enough to detect, and there, some landmines use RDX, and you almost have no chance of detecting that. And so if you use an RDX landmine with plastic or wood, uh, good luck trying to locate it. Uh, and there are a variety of chemical vapor sensors in use. I'm not going to go through all of them because we don't have time. Uh, we've been interested in the amplified fluorescence quenching using conjugated polymers, and also vapor sensors based on thin film nanosensors, and I should point out that the machine that allows uh, my colleagues, Andy Kummel and Ivan Schuler in chemistry and physics and myself to make these was a machine that was built by a member in the audience here, Bernd Fruberger, who's uh, going to stand up and give a round of applause to Bernd. <laughs> and now he runs the clean room for here in Nano 3. So, <laughs> And so we have a peroxide-specific sensor that somewhat useful for detecting improvised explosives, but not really useful for landmines. And we have some things that light up in the presence of peroxide, so they turn on fluorescence. And uh, there has been some commercialization, one in MIT polymer in the FIDO TNT sensor, which the Army is, uh, I know, tested for landmines. I don't know how widely adopted it is. The other is a company we've collaborated with, which has improved on our approach and developed their own 
uh, X-spray approach for detecting explosives. And you can detect multiple fingerprints from traces of someone who's handled explosives. Uh, we have things that go down to femtograms. You can visualize tiny amounts of explosives. And as I said, this company has commercialized it and has about 50 units in Iraq and uh, uh, Afghanistan. And it was even on a CSI Miami episode, so obviously it has to work. <laughs> so thank you for your attention, and uh, thank Carlos for a very provocative exhibit. Uh, it's one thing to think about these in the lab, and it's another to see what the actual consequences are. Okay. Microphone. Hola. <laughs> These lights feel like an interrogation. <laughs> <laughs> Esto es un cuestión para el señor Telac. Él, él nos dijo de um, las minas que están a la frontera de Perú y Bolivia y Chile. ¿Qué los ha puesto allá? ¿De gobiernos de sus países o son puestos por los rebeldes o los narcotraficantes que que han puesto al ahí en el América del Sur a las minas a las minas que nos ha puesto allá. Um, but the, the question is um, who, who, who put the uh, the mines? Um, ¿Dónde, señora? Disculpe. Okay, and what we could do is he he'll answer in Spanish and I'll translate. Uh, en, en, entre los límites de Argentina, Chile, Chile, eh, Perú, inclusive Perú, Bolivia, lo, los eh, que han puesto o sembrado minas han sido los, los ejércitos, los estados. It is the army of these countries that have installed the mines. Por, por los problemas limítrofes que y las guerras pasadas. Because there were uh, problems regarding where the border was going to be traced. No, no es el caso de Colombia, donde eh, tanto el ejército como eh, la FARC, los grupos eh, guerrilleros, ambos eh, utilizan las minas para atacarse y defenderse. En Colombia, instead, es el gobierno, el the, the army y the FARC que han deployed these mines. I have a question about um, a technique I heard about. It's rather low tech for planting flower seeds in areas where there might have been mines and then the seeds interact chemically and turn a particular color to indicate that there are mines buried there. I don't know if anyone can comment on that. Bill? <laughs> I vaguely remember reading something about that where plants will take up TNT, for example, and uh, that they could potentially be used to extract it out of the soil, and then I forget how they were going to analyze it in the plants, but uh, I think that's an experimental method. I don't, I don't think it's put into practice. You can imagine the, the problems in that first you'd have to figure out some way to sow the seeds without getting blown up <laughs> to get uniform coverage, and then you'd have to somehow read out, you know, their TNT content. But there are some plants I know that will concentrate explosives from the soil. I'm curious if, uh, as our ability to detect mines uh, enhanced, did people start making mines that were harder to detect? 
or do they just oh make yeah the, yeah they made metal free mines so that you couldn't locate them with metal detectors mm -hmm. so, so yes people made them harder to detect mm -hmm. <laughs> so it seems like technology is not the answer pardon me <laughs> seems like technology is not the answer then that's right it's very difficult to remove them that's why i think you know, I know people have looked at making li mines with a lifetime at which they deactivate, and it seems like that's really the only reasonable way to do it if you're going to use them. But. Uh, I wonder if anyone has ever been uh, sort of tried for international war crimes for any organizations or heads of organizations have been tried, at, you know, for, for planting war mines that you know of, or yeah, for planting mines. I really don't know. I think that not, but I really don't, don't know. In many countries, it is not usual that you, you make these things against the government. I think that this is usual here in the States, but not in <laughs> all, over, all over the world, because it's not... Um, another question about the, uh, the technological solutions, I know, is just sheer expense, a lot of what you're talking about, and distribution of, of those sorts of things. I, I know from working with uh, uh, physicians against landmines that even in terms of fitting prostheses, they're faced with the fact that there aren't even doctors in many of the regions where uh, these are dispersed, because they're often in, in very remote and, and poor areas, and so they're, they're working for training people who aren't physicians to, to fit prostheses. So I'm wondering about the sort of, you know, how the developing relate to sort of the geographic uh, distribution of mines, geographic and economic situations. You know, are they, um, as more geared towards you, in thinking about the technologies for uh, detecting them, are they thought about in relationship to sort of accessibility to the communities that are facing these because it seems like some of the like you mentioned that the technologies that do are commercialized are being used in places by the military rather than in civilian use uh, yeah I, d I don't understand really why mines are so widely used simply because usually the military under great hazard to themselves mm -hmm has to get rid of them later. So I would think that that alone would motivate, you know, a, a different approach to <laughs> their deactivation and removal. Yeah. And so the problem is initially these things usually are put in to defend uh, a military installation during a time of war, or the U.S., I guess, refused to sign the treaty because they want an exception to leave landmines in the DMZ between North and South Korea yeah. because it, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> if you could take the landmines out, and then you could have a bunch of people sitting there with guns at each other. So you can somewhat see that their logic of wanting to keep that one region. So that's why I think you're not going to get military to give up landmines. <laughs> but it seems to me the technology is there to make them safer to use so that they don't have these 20-year life, 30-year lifetimes where they keep killing people after they're no longer useful. That seems to be the, the real solution. But that's just my opinion. I don't... Yeah. Misha. Um, 
Sobre la instalación afuera, quiero preguntar uh, cómo tenía la inspiración, porque no es el problema que no hay estas señas en los lugares donde están las minas, ¿verdad? Y niños o otra gente um, ir ahí en esos lugares. ¿Y por qué solo estás ahí para una semana? Y, y <laughs> <laughs> so my question was um, about the installation outside. Uh, how did you get the inspiration for it? If um, my understanding is the problem is that there such signs don't exist, and then children walk into those areas. Um, and also, I'm curious as to why it's only up for one week. ¿Por qué si justamente el problema es que no hay carteles para avisar? Entonces pusiste los carteles. ¿Quieres contestarlo en inglés? No, no, no. Sobre la primera parte de la pregunta. About the first part of the question. La idea es generar una provocación sobre el público universitario americano también sobre este tema. The idea is to generate uh, to, to provoke the university public in, in here. Porque Estados Unidos, eh, como dijo Bill, es uno de los principales fabricantes y uno de los pocos países que no firma o se re, resiste a firmar el tratado de no proliferación de estas armas. Because the United States is the main producer of these mines and one of the few that is not uh, does not subscribe to the uh, Uh, international treaties regarding them. Referido a la semana de autorizaciones. About the week. No sé. It wasn't up to him. <laughs> uh, I wonder if you considered for this installation or for, for previous installations of this particular piece uh, outdoors specifically. Um, If if you have considered doing uh, doing it sort of more um, without permission, so <laughs> so you didn't actually have you know the, the support of the university and, and everyone. Else. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, instead of reaching you know 50 people in this room. Eh, en realidad yo eh, presenté el proyecto para trabajar en distintos espacios del campus. I, I presented the, the, the space uh, to uh, uh, prospectively to be made in different parts of the campus. Eh, quizás eh, si viviría aquí y sería profesor de, la, de esta universidad, eh, quizás si hubiese trabajado de una forma más eh, sub, eh, subversiva, digamos. If, 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 if I uh, was maybe uh, part of the faculty here and I was, uh, I was living here, maybe I would have done something a little more subversive. Pero soy un invitado, no, no, <laughs> me, estoy, estoy aquí por solo 10 días. But I'm a guest. It's, uh, I'm, I'm here just for 10 days. Igual creo que eh, el comité de Calitú toma también un eh, partido por este, por este tema y, y creo que es una colaboración también para poner el tema en, en discusión, o sea que estoy agradecido también. I also consider that the Cal, Calitú uh, committee is taking a stand in this and so we're working together to present this to the rest of the community here. Uh -huh. Eh, sí, estamos eh, inclusive eh, eh, trabajando en... Ayer justamente pensábamos con el profesor Warren Critchlow y con Brian Goldfart eh, hacer una acción en simultáneo en, entre Canadá, Argentina y Estados Unidos. We were thinking, in fact, of doing something simultaneous in Canada, here and in Argentina mm -hmm. with the fellows he mentioned. In, in <laughs> I 
Yeah, Vení, no, so, algo, uh, algo que agregar para... Uh, thank you very much for coming. Ah, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.